thank you. It's a great delight to uh, to um, use this new technology for me anyway uh, to present what has happened to us at the Royal Brompton Hospital when we attempted to start a simulation program uh, back in 2008. Uh, and uh, I will take you through through our journey, uh, how how we discovered things, which wasn't really the correct way to do things, but we learned a lot along the way. So my first slide is really to show you what the SPRINT, that's a simulated pediatric resuscitation team training program, what SPRINT has achieved in the last four to five years. Um, and I'll bring this slide up at the end, but just, just to show you where, where we've got to. Um, why, why did we come about? I, I'm a consultant in pediatric intensive care, and uh, myself and others were uh, worried about what was happening during resuscitations on the uh, intensive care unit. It was quite obvious that there was chaotic team behavior. Uh, and as a result of that, um, people were getting very worried whenever anything was going wrong. Uh, we, we could see that there wasn't clear leadership, uh, and no one really knew what to do. And, and it was not an unusual event to have a room full of 30 to 40 people during an arrest who, who uh, didn't really know what to do. So. Um, a couple of us, myself, my consultant colleague, uh, Meredith Allen, and four nurse educators uh, got together and expressed our anxieties and, and thought that we should uh, improve confidence and performance and team working skills for, for all for the whole team that was involved in caring for these children on the intensive care unit. We wanted to improve performance in real life emergencies. We work on a, on a cardiorespiratory intensive care unit, and uh, the majority of patients have had uh, cardiac surgery or, or are about to have cardiac surgery. What we didn't know uh, was that there was this book. And I will. Uh, the reason I'm putting this at the beginning, which certainly wasn't our, our journey at the beginning, is that if, if ha having gone through this journey uh, and then coincidentally read this book, uh, this was the answer to our problems. And we should have read this at first. Um, there are, there's an eight-step process for leading change, according to the, the uh, Professor John Cotter. Um, and uh, these are the uh, outlined changes that he describes in his book. And I think life would have been much easier if we had gone from one to eight rather than jumping about. But we, we did this in a, we did our program in a non-strategic way, in a more responsive way. So how, how did we start doing this, uh, this program, and what mistakes did we make? Well, the phase one was just we got together, and we thought we're enthusiastic individuals. We'll, we'll just do it. So in 2008, we had a vision, which was good. And uh, it, throughout the talk, when I go through phases, um, the uh, numbered red uh, uh, sentences um, match up to Cotter's uh, principles. So, so we started quite well. We, we had a vision, which was number one, and we created a guiding team. Um, we decided that uh, from the little that we knew, we wanted it to be into professional simulation. We wanted people to have their own roles. We weren't doing it in a threatening way. We, we didn't want to assess people. Uh, we wanted to improve patient safety. And we, want, we, we could only do it on our intensive care unit because uh, there was nowhere else really to do it. So um, we thought about where, where we could do it. On the intensive care unit, there's no dedicated space. We would just wait for the day and then find out which patients had vacated spaces, and there we would do it. Uh, we had some very basic equipment, and we stored that in our offices. So um, the plan setup was similar to what you can see in this photograph. Um, we had a vision that we would cre create scenarios from actual real events, so we wrote up uh, uh, scenarios from what really had happened in the week or month before. Uh, we set these uh, simulation sessions to be twice a month. We used all available staff at the time. Uh, and we did it on the intensive care unit or on the ward. The model you can he see here is a, a resus Annie, uh, which is a, a simple model that has no technology at all. Uh, and most of the things that you can see are merely stuck on the model with tape. Uh, and similar here, a close-up, you can see um, that, that we've just stuck uh, tapes and drains on uh, and, and put a tube in, in the mouth. We didn't fully inform people beforehand. We just set the alarms off and said there's an arrest in bed space three. 
um, as I said, we had basic equipment. Uh, we did use real time. We, we uh, made people do draw up their drugs as they should do, um, apart from morphine. We used real syringes, we had a real arrest call, and we didn't make people be other than what they were. And then afterwards, we did what we called then debriefing. Essentially, we talked through what had happened. This was with no training at all at the time. Uh, after a year, we entered into phase two. And at this point, uh, we wanted to give up. Um, we had a very exhausted, small, remember it's two, two consultants and two nurses, small resuscitation team. And we identified that we needed recognition. No one really knew what we were doing. Uh, and, and that led to the fact they didn't understand why we were doing it. Um, Cotter's uh, uh, important points, uh, three and four, you, it's very important to get buy-in and communication. And I'll refer to that uh, later in this presentation as well. We didn't have dedicated faculty. We were doing this all in our spare time. Uh, and we needed more resources for realism because we were having to pretend quite a lot of things with the model that, that didn't do anything. So we thought about doing something that was very novel to us as academic uh, clinicians. Um, we thought about marketing and buying in. We presented our case to the medical director, to uh, uh, more into professional teams at clinical governance days where the whole hospital meets to, uh, to understand about learning and education. We presented our case to the medical board. And we also went to the head of nursing. That's an important point. We went above senior nursing staff who were not at that point interested in our project. We went to the heads of the departments. And then as far as marketing in the main foyer in the front of the hospital, we laid out our simple models and our equipment and put some posters up and told everyone what we were doing. We sent um, notices and emails of system changes to various important people throughout the hospital. And we discovered uh, the hospital PR department and liaised with them and got screen displays of, uh, of our program and um, a publication in the hospital monthly newsletter. We also spent some uh, time in branding ourselves. We thought of a name, because up until now, we were just the resuscitation team. We thought up a, a name and, and a logo. In addition to this, during this phase two, we expanded our faculty. Um, we, 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 having done our uh, buy-in of senior management, we managed to establish a two days per week nurse project manager who was dedicated to, to our new sprint, sprint program. We uh, established that we'd get a dedicated one day a week uh, sprint technician. In addition, we went across departments and interested two anesthetic consultant colleagues and asked all of our um, middle grade registrar uh, fellow um, uh, employees whether they'd like to volunteer to help. And two of them were interested and wanted to help. Um, the other problem that we had at this time was that our equipment was very simple. We applied to the local charity for uh, funding to fund a Laird Sim baby. This charity funding would not have occurred if we hadn't done our marketing, as I said before, in the foyer, the front of the hospital. It happened to be right next to the flower shop, which was run by the uh, ladies who support the Royal Brompton Hospital. And they were so interested in our uh, presentation that this is how we got the link. And they came and approached us and said, what can we do to help you fund your program? Um, we applied for audiovisual equipment to the London Deanery, the local uh, 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 education system uh, in London. And uh, through our, our buy-in from senior uh, heads, we managed to establish one cubicle, one space, uh, enclosed space in PICU that was called the Sprint Cubicle. We developed more scenarios and wrote them out. And we also started thinking about a two-way evaluation process for quality improvement. So we started to get the people who are participating to tell us what they thought of the program. So by phase three, we thought, originally when I did this talk in 2010-11, we thought that we had reached success. But this was not success. We needed to keep momentum going for the Sprint team members, the Sprint faculty up until now, apart from a two-day project manager and a one-day technician, were all voluntary. 
So this is where I refer to John Cotter's uh, plan number six of short-term wins. We needed to keep our Sprint faculty on board. Um, we also needed dedicated time for participants. We needed to broaden our action, be empowered to broaden our action, which is point five. And we needed to expand to other areas uh, to match innovation to needs assessments. So starting with uh, short-term wins, trying to maintain uh, the de development of Sprint faculty, uh, we made sure that everyone received education in, in the Sprint faculty. They went on training the trainer courses, which our local London deanery uh, runs. We wanted to consolidate the learning to expand into the psychological impulse, input of adult learning and debriefing. Uh, and we did this by uh, uh, recruiting a, a training program from Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, where, they, where Peter Weinstock came and gave us some, some graduate and undergraduate courses. And we wanted to actively critique our performance as part of an ongoing process to improve team techniques and learning. And this last one, the active critique, was, was uh, very rewarding for all the faculty members. The uh, second thing was to uh, empower broader action by getting dedicated time for participants. By now, of course, we had a name, we had Sprint, we were getting to be better known in the hospital, we had a room, and we had some decent equipment. So we managed to get dedicated time to nurses, one anaesthetic trainee, one PICU fellow, and one PICU SHO every second Monday uh, of the month. Uh, we started using innovative models in order to match the needs uh, of of the situations that were occurring on the intensive care unit. Uh, and in doing so, we crossed departments again into the cardiothoracic department, who were very interested in problems with children who, had come, who were unable to come off cardiac bypass after cardiac surgery and who uh, came to the intensive care unit on ECMO circuit. And what happened to those children when um, pericardial tamponade occurred through bleeding and cessation of the ECMO circuit. By now, we had a larger faculty. Um, you can see from here that the uh, faculty ranges from uh, consultants, pediatric intensive care um, department, cardiothoracic department, nursing on the intensive care unit on the pediatric wards, um, and, uh, and cardiology. Honorary faculty who came and went included um, Meredith Allen, who went to Melbourne, Martin Stocker, who went to Switzerland, and Linda Menadieu, who was going to Australia. So all this effort occurred. We felt we were really doing very well, but unfortunately, our participants were still reluctant learners. There were no charge nurses, that is, the senior nurses in the intensive care unit. None of them were turning up at all. Participants were still getting upset, and they were not convinced of lessons learned. So in phase four, we really thought that we were approaching success. We decided to introduce safety training and CRM training before the course. This was particularly targeted to help the participants feel comfortable and understand why we were doing the course. Um, we recognized that our faculty needed to be trained in debriefing techniques, some of the ways in which we were debriefing were upsetting the, the participants. And we wanted to keep it sustainable, both for faculty and participants, and to keep it innovative. So this is the Cotter's seventh point, never let up. So we decided that we'd keep going. We thought about how our participants would be learning. We recognized that in a specialized card cardiothoracic department, we had to keep it realistic. And we did have an issue that most of the, uh, some of the very serious events, we need to reopen the chest uh, for, for, uh, for realism of the whole interprofessional team of intensive care unit. We wanted the participants to feel safe beforehand. And we had identified that the faculty needed to be trained in debriefing adult learning techniques. We recognized that debriefing was where the learning was at. So now our courses changed from what they had been before in that we started with 30 minutes of helping people feel safe and giving them examples of what crisis resource management was and why it was important. So we would start with gameplay to demonstrate 
principles of crisis resource management and also to create a safe environment amongst the team that were about to undergo simulation. We would introduce them to mannequin and the surroundings of the cubicle and, and demonstrate that everything was as real as normal. And we very, very uh, clearly and uh, assuredly told them that this was a non-judgmental and collegial environment. All the information that would occur within a simulation was absolutely confidential. And it, it, it had appeared previously, because we worked in the same place that we were leading these scenarios, that people were worried that we were judging them and then talking about what, they, what their performance was like outside the scenario. Then we would do the simulation for 15 minutes. Um, I'll just before going into simulation, I'll tell you more about our innovative models that we used basically targeted towards cardiac intensive care. As, we, as I had said, we identified that emergency re simulations were required, and we had been pretending up until now. So we developed an open chest Harley baby, which is for pediatric cardiac patients in which the, the, the skin and sternum can be opened for tamponade to be released and also an open chest adult model for the adult congenital heart patients. We also had developed, as said before, a recognition of ECMO failure, an e open chest ECMO model. And now I'll show you one of the simulations, uh, that what the, the standard that we have reached at the current time. Okay, so that was a, a simulation um, demonstrating pericardial tamponade where we managed to get the, the involvement, the real involvement of the cardiothoracic surgeons because they had to open the chest uh, in, a, in, a, in a normal way and release the blood from around the heart. So after a simulation, uh, at this stage we were now going into the longest part of the simulation. I have to say when we started was the shortest part of a 40-minute uh, video-assisted debriefing. And by now, we had learned uh, some academic uh, uh, evidence-based ways of, of how to debrief and how to engage participants in understanding and discovering themselves uh, 
what, how, how to change what had happened and how to improve performance. So now it's 20, 2012. And we are now part of the culture of the Royal Brompton Hospital, which, is a, which, which I feel is a great achievement. Uh, John Cotter's eighth point, we've incorporated change into the culture. Certainly, we've incorporated it into the pediatric areas of the hospital, and we're expanding now, uh, as mentioned, into adult congenital heart disease. Uh, we're well known throughout the hospital. However, as soon as you think things are going well, our Sprint mod project manager suddenly had to leave the country. She was, she was sent out of the country by the, um, by the, uh, uh, because her visa had run out. She had no choice to stay. Uh, I'm one of the Sprint directors. I was seconded to emergently direct the pediatric intensive care unit, so my time was impacted upon. And my colleague, the other Sprint director, decided to take up a post in Melbourne. So. Going back to uh, Cotter's eight-step process for leading change, I'll wrap up this talk uh, with uh, showing you um, matching up the achievements from 2008 to 2012 with his points. So uh, this is slightly skewed, <laughs> but I'll bring them in. First of all, we developed a vision, which uh, so the, the numbers on the right are um, the way we did it, and the, the black writing and numbers on the left are the way that John Cotter uh, decides to do it to, sh to show you how, how we did things. First of all, we developed a vision. Then we developed a guiding team. So we're near the top there. We were okay. Uh, then we, we discovered that we needed to, to uh, create a sense of urgency and to get some buy in. Uh, and late in the day, we thought about uh, communicating our vision to other people around us in order to support our, our progress. Um, by that time, our faculty was waning and getting tired, so we picked up our legs and thought that we need to get some more short-term wins, help people educate and promote them. Um, broad action uh, came in afterwards, where we started uh, on innovative models. And uh, uh, the, the change uh, was incorporated into the culture, actually, um, having done all those things. The one that we found most challenging, which is challenging us now again and throughout our, our course, is uh, never letting up. Uh, these these uh, um, projects uh, or programs that are started from within rather than from without, that are started from a department, from the people within the department, and that, that continue in a volunteer manner, uh, are very challenging continuously. So it's important to, uh, to uh, continue not to let up. So I'll finish with my final slide, which demonstrates again all, all the things we have achieved. And uh, remember, the, the title of this talk is Diary of the Mistakes Made. So I hope that if anyone is uh, considering starting a similar program in their hospital, they look carefully at the mistakes that I've described that we made. Um, but uh, even if you make all the mistakes, which is why I feel I'm an expert on this now, um, you can still get somewhere. Uh, so that's the end of my talk, and thank you for listening.